Good day. Welcome to the lecture. Let's start with a story. In the 1980s, there was a television show called Saint Elsewhere, which is a medical drama set in the south of Boston. You know, medical drama that's a lot of blood and gore in the ER, etc. Now, one time, there was a Filipino family that lost a brother to Bangungot. So the doctor wanted to give a medical explanation for Bangungot, but the family said, there's no need. We're Filipinos and we believe in the Batibat. And a Batibat is a ghost that goes to your sleep and kills you. Nowadays, there, nowadays, there are medical explanations for uh, Bangungot, ranging from pancreatitis to uh, a genetic code that is activated. But these explanations do not account for why a lot of Southeast Asian males of a certain age get victimized by sudden death uh, during sleep. So normally, there will always be a distinction between science and religion. Science and religion would always conflict. Uh, however, is that the only relationship that is possible between science and religion? But before we go to our discussion, you might ask why I am the one giving the lecture on this uh, relationship between science and religion. I'm a medievalist. And what's a medievalist got, got, got to do with the relationship between science and religion? Well, I have been asked always whether religious societies can ever be scientific. And it's true. It's only at a certain point in human history that science and religion would conflict. So maybe there is a relationship beyond conflict between science and religion. Now, why science and religion are in conflict? Because science is always about the natural world, what is sensible, what is uh, understood through empirical data. While religion would always think that the sensible world is imbued with the supernatural, with uh, the divine and what is holy. So normally they would contradict because science would say, how can we know something that has no empirical data, that can, cannot, cannot be known through the senses? But maybe there's a relationship between science and religion beyond conflict. And that's what this lecture is all about. What could that relationship be? Is it a synthesis between science and religion? Is it science becoming religion? My proposal is that science and religion would continue to be different, but maybe they can have a dialogue. Now, in our discussion, we begin with a fact. And what's the fact? That there's a great body of scientific studies that's taking seriously their claims of religion. So these are not people who, who are religious people but are doing science, but these are scientists, physicists, neurobiologists, psychologists, uh, evolutionary biologists who are taking seriously the claims of religion. They're asking questions like whether obesity has something to do with the fact that you live in the Bible Belt. They're also asking questions whether we can scan the brains of people who are, able to scan, who are able to put themselves in a meditative state. So if we put someone who is an expert in meditation and scan his brain, what will we see? Will there be a difference between his brain and the brains of those who can't put themselves in a meditative state? So they're also asking questions like, would there be a difference between the brain of someone who's a religionist vis-a-vis -vis someone who's a spiritualist? If we knew what a person, a happy person is, can we check his physiology and check whether his uh, brain would also be different once he, he is a believer or not? So would there be a difference between the brain scans of believers and unbelievers? Would we be finally able to decide whether Jesuits are more intelligent than LaSalle brothers? These are the questions of neurotheology. Now, our point is not to ask science to defend religion. And why is that? Because for those who believe in God, there is no need for any kind of evidence. And for those who do not believe in God, no evidence is ever sufficient. So the point is not to use science to defend religion. The point is to see whether science can know some of the claims of religion. Why is it that we cannot ask science to defend religion? And that is because nowadays, people are also 
skeptical about the universal and absolute claims of science. More and more people are casting doubt on science. There are people who, who think that big history is, is false, or evolution is false, or uh, climate change is a hoax. And most of these people are believers. I hope that you're not one of them. So there is, in fact, some evidence that a certain faith system would automatically deny science. And that is the problem that science is confronting. So it is funny that in our age, not only is science casting doubt on religion, but more and more people are not listening to science when it comes to public policy, when it comes to their health, when it comes to their lifestyle. And this leads to greater disasters and suffering when people do not look to science for answers. So that's the whole problem. How can science communicate to a greater number of people? And that is why they're asking themselves, why do people continue to believe in creation, in myths, in rituals? Why do people not base their lives on facts? So these are the questions that scientists are asking. So one of the things that they're saying is that in fact, if we look at creation, look at nature, and see how it creates itself, we'll realize that it will also produce in us the same feelings of awe or worship. So the more we see the scientific explanation for landscapes or seascapes, the more we respect nature, the more we make nature holy or divine, but that understanding is based on science. So you have a choice between understanding the seascape that you're diving in from a mythical point of view, from a biblical point of view, or from a scientific point of view. But a scientific point of view would make you respect nature as well, and maybe preserve nature or work towards uh, better environmental uh, policies. The other side of this is evolutionary biology. And what is evolutionary biology saying? That perhaps when we look at the evolution of human beings, when human beings uh, evolve from human, uh, Homo erectus to Homo sapiens, we realize that the brain enlarged, yes, but it was also at that time that people began to make elaborate burial sites. And, and that's like one of the things that we see here in our, in our, in our image, that the, the, uh, the, one of the, the rituals that we have in the, in the north for burial. What do we notice here? That they're imbued with objects which have nothing to do with survival. So when we evolved from Homo erectus to Homo sapiens, we didn't just make flint instruments. We started to make objects that we give to the dead. Objects that would require a lot of attention, a lot of focus, and a lot of time, which might reveal that these are objects that our ancestors made with love. In other words, evolutionary biology is saying that when we evolve as homo sapiens, that's when we decided to give respect to the dead. That's when we had uh, elaborate burial grounds. That's when we had burial rituals. The question, therefore, is does the creation or the construction of religion and the invention of these objects, which have nothing to do with survival in itself, it's, these are gifts that we give to the dead. It's for their survival in the afterlife. Does this have to do with evolution itself? In other words, that we evolve from Homo erectus to Homo sapiens by inventing these myths and these rituals and these objects. And that's what they're saying. In fact, we notice that animals also have rituals. They have mating rituals. 
So the question of evolutionary biology is that perhaps rituals or this devotion for the dead or this creation of art, they fulfill a certain function beyond survival, beyond eating and, and drinking, etc. Maybe they have, they have a function, all right, that is necessary also for our own evolution. So what we're saying here is that perhaps things that we do, like storytelling, all right, the things that have to do with, with the gods, the stories of legends and the beginnings of our, our, our mountains and our seas, etc. This has also something to do with evolution. And when we say evolution, it has something to do with, not with the survival of the fittest, right? Evolution has something to do with our development and our adaptation to our environment so that we can, we can uh, have a relationship with it. So storytelling in itself might have a biological function. It might enable us to exist as human beings. So scientists, therefore, are no longer dismissing the claims of religion. They are taking them very seriously and they're looking for evidence. But this will not necessarily prove that God exists. Why? Because if our belief in the afterlife or in the myths or in the rituals is because of a biological impetus, then it might show that there is really no God. In other words, we're not doing this because there is an, an actual omnipotent and omniscient power that exists. So it is not the fact that, you know, these things happen and therefore religion is true. That's not, that's not what we're saying. But what we're saying is that scientists are taking the claims of religion seriously and they are no longer dismissing them. And therefore, scientists are no longer seeing that conflict is the only possible relationship between science and religion. What they're saying is that, in fact, what it means to be human is both to solve problems through facts, through uh, science, but also to create a symbolic language, to create religion, to create the myths, to create the rituals. So science are saying that, that to be human is both to invent things that are based on problem solving, that, seeks to, that seek to solve problems, but also to give us beauty, to make us, to inspire us, etc. So therefore, the point is that science and art and religion and culture are both human endeavors. And they are both necessary for our continued survival as human beings. So what does this tell us? How can we apply this to our day-to-day to -to -day life? All right? The real problem is, how do I know myself? How do I see myself? I can see myself both scientifically, that I try to prove myself, all right? So if I say that I can make money, that I actually make money, that I, I give an evidence for that claim of my identity. But that is not the only thing that is, uh, that is myself. It is also the story that I tell myself, the myth that I make for myself. So the whole point is not only to see the science of my identity, which is very, very important, the evidence of who I am, but also the story that I say. Because if I don't tell my own story, someone else will. And social development, for example, is this going to happen simply through science? For a while now, people say that we will develop a society only through science. Indeed, we will. But there is the other side of the story of development. Because development is a story. So if we don't know how to tell the story of science, science itself will not communicate to politicians and communities. Science has to learn to tell its own myth. And for that, it requires a dialogue with religion. 
So the point is to see that the relationship between science and religion is no longer just about conflict, but of dialogue. And that we ourselves are both called to become scientists and believers. And as believers, we can understand our religion scientifically because we are called to understand what we believe. And today, we need to understand religion scientifically as well.